good evening, everyone. Perhaps that's not the best, because I'll be standing here. Uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction to the protection of human lives, wherever they are, whenever they are, in any situation. So protection of human rights, uh, human lives in both our conflict and peace situation. The problem is that human beings are very much capable of committing inhumanity to our fellow humans. And it happens so often in human history. So what can we do to avoid such atrocities to happen again? And the objective is to provide some uh, international law-based guide for our action. And Natalie will hand out some petitions toward the end of the evening. And I will show you some international instruments. Historically, uh, the biggest event that had affected the whole world in terms of human suffering was the First World War. The second would be, of course, the Second World War, where cities were uh, carpet bombed. The worst uh, hit city in Europe was Warsaw in Poland, and in Asia it was Manila in the Philippines. The whole cities were uh, just ravaged, and so much suffering had taken place. And that continues today. We had the Holocaust of the Jewish people in uh, all of Europe, uh, together with the, what we now call the travelers, the Roma, and it happened again in all over the place. In, in Asia, you have Nanjing massacre, uh, you have Cambodia, and then in Europe, you have Bosnia and Armenia, the Ukraine, and in Africa, you have Rwanda, Darfur. Including Hiroshima and Nagasaki for the nuclear weapons, and many more, true. So the United Nations was formed at the end of the Second World War, and governments met and said, maybe we should come up with an agreement among uh, the world governments. This was the Charter of the United Nations, in which human rights were uh, written for the first time in history. As such, in the past they were known as used and viewed as uh, natural law, all kinds of stuff. But for the first time in world history, it was called human rights. Followed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And then uh, there was where uh, world governments agreed that we should have uh, rights uh, for everyone. So human rights for the first time in history meant whether you're with the majority, as in the case of the Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese people, or the minority, like the Tamils, the, uh, the Berthers, the Muslims, or people of different uh, sex, sex uh, uh, sexual orientation, color, language, social status, and so on. In short, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, male or female, or LGBTQ, everyone literally has rights. Even if in times of emergency where there is uh, internal troubles, like fighting going on between the government and maybe the civil society organizations, there are minimum rights. Under international law, they're called non-derogable rights, which means whatever happens, certain minimum core remains. And they include, you cannot take the life of people arbitrarily execution without the final decision of the court, torture, slavery. Uh, and there's such a thing called as use comments or core values which are accepted by all countries regardless of uh, the situation of armed conflict or peace. So in short, even if there's armed conflict going on, like there are rebel groups, uh, certain minimum guarantees still remain under use comments. So it, just because there is civil war going on does not mean there are no protection for people. In fact, everyone, including soldiers, combatants, rebels, and especially civilians, all still supposed to be protected under international law, which comes from the International Committee of the Red Cross. You have the 
four Geneva Conventions. Uh, Geneva Convention number one says there are protection to be guaranteed in the field, uh, even if there's fighting going on. Geneva Convention number two, at sea. Uh, if there are rebels or military troops or civilians at sea, there's still some level of protection. Third, Geneva Convention is prisoner of war. Fourth, very importantly, civilian persons are protected, even in the situation of armed conflict. There are additional instruments. In the case of Sri Lanka, for example, Protocol Number no. 2, 1977, would even have additional instruments that would say there are more uh, uh, instruments that would provide for the protection of civilians, even if there is armed conflict. So almost all countries of the world recognize the laws of war to different levels, okay? And including Sri Lanka recognizes the four Geneva Conventions. Okay, now this is very important. Article two common to the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 states that the laws of war applies for the following conditions. Of course, if war is declared, but let's not uh, fool ourselves. Which war was declared after the Second World War? Almost none was declared. What does Article 2 common to the Four Geneva Convention say? It does not matter. Even if the war is not declared, there's still protection to be guaranteed. The third one, all countries which have uh, representatives at the United Nations, in Geneva, Switzerland, who have, uh, or contracting parties because they've affixed their signatures are bound by the laws of war. But more importantly, it even says as soon as our conflict erupts, whether a party to the conflict had signed the instrument or not, does not matter. The laws of war still apply. And all countries of the world have recognized, uh, almost all countries have recognized the four Geneva Conventions. Now, if there is real high level armed conflict, what is the minimum, minimum level of protection? This is under the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, uh, under the peremptory norms, it says certain categories uh, are to be recognized at all times for all. Number one, if somebody, rebel, civilian, or soldier, anyone, it could be, Tamil, could be Sinhalese, could be the rebel, could be the government forces, it doesn't matter. If they're sick, they're exempted. If they are wounded, they're exempted. If they are detained, means under the power of another party, it could be the rebel under the military, government troops, or the government troops under the rebel, it doesn't matter, they're all protected. And there should be no practice of torture, mutilation, hostage taking, degrading treatment, and extrajudicial execution, which means killing without the judicial guarantees, without the final decision of a regularly constituted tribunal. So those are very minimal, uh, which we cannot get rid of. This chart shows that whether it's war or peace, uh, under the blue sign here, if you assume there's absolute peace, theoretical, not real, uh, there's zero level of violence, and as you go up, there's higher level, and this will be war here, armed conflict. Lowest level will be no violence, isolated acts of violence, conspiracy, civil war, which would be Sri Lanka, and then war of national liberation against a colonial power, and war between at least two countries. And this is the level of protection of all kinds. The international human rights law would say, if there's peace, there's full protection of international human rights law. And even if there's war, human rights do not go to the level of zero. There is a minimum core. Right to life, no torture, no slavery, no killing without a judicial decision, final decision of the court. And the same way with the war, the higher the level of conflict, international war, the lower the level of human rights, but the higher level of the application of the laws of war. 
So the reasons why states and rebels go to armed conflict, use that bellow, and when there's armed conflict, what are the protection and guarantees in armed conflict? It's using bellow. So this chart summarizes the minimum guarantee which is applicable to all at all times. Okay, I just have one last quote at the end. Uh, this was said by Pope Paul VI, 1972 World Day of Peace. If you want peace, you have to work for justice. Thank you. <laughs>